This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Released on Sunday, March 30th, 2014, in St. Louis, Missouri, This Agile Life, Episode 42. We can all just get along. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on This Agile Life. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro. Joining me today are my co-hosts on Twitter, The Agile Factor, Jason Tice. Hi, John. What are you trying to improve today? That's, your, that's I guess, your key sign-on phrase, huh? That's our, that's our theme of the quarter. We can explain what that is sometime, some other time. Also joining me tonight, the Agile Atheist on Twitter, Lee McCauley. Hi, John. Hi, Jason. How's it going? It's going well, Lee. How are you? It's going well. I'm doing good. Excellent. Guys, we have a special guest with us tonight, Woody Zool. Woody currently works as an application dev manager and agile coach at Hunter Industries in San Diego, California. Woody has been programming for more than 30 years and has recently become well known for working with his team at Hunter Industries to pioneer a group programming method known as mob programming. Woody, welcome to This Agile Life. Well, thank you. We're very pleased, Woody, to have you here with us tonight. I think it was Jason who first tipped us off to the idea of mob programming, right, Jason? Uh, yes, correct. And actually, it was um, I first learned of it, Woody. Uh, it was reviewing sessions. I, I know you had a, a session for the Agile 2013 conference. I don't know if it. I think you did. You present that or not? Where you talked about mobbing? Yes. But I I remember from seeing the session description, I kind of said, "Wow, this sounds different." And so. Um, I think all of us on the podcast have had various experiences with it that I think we'll talk about tonight, and we'd like to get your, your feedback and ideas. Cool. Yeah, why don't we start, guys, and have Woody give us a basic overview of mob programming, and uh, so our listening audience gets uh, some information, some ideas about what it is. So what is it, Woody? Okay, so... There's sort of a phrase we like to use, that we've got all the brilliant minds working on the same thing at the same time, in the same space, which is sort of what Agile's about, is getting people working together. But we add one little wrinkle to it, and that's the idea of working at the same computer. So it's sort of like pair programming, two people at one computer, but with more than two people, three or more. With two, it's a pair, of course. And that's the basic idea. It's, it's a bunch of people working together at a single computer instead of broken up into their own cubicles or working at their own computers at their own, own desks. That's it in a nutshell. It's, it's a lot more to it than that, but that's sort of the basic idea. I have to admit, when I first heard about the idea of mob programming and when, when Jason brought it up and we were talking about it a little bit on the show, I thought, hmm, that sounds crazy. <laughs> How could that possibly work? How could you have four or five people all working on a single computer and have them be productive? So how did you come to this idea? This isn't necessarily an idea that I had or an idea that anybody had. You know, it's not like we were sitting around going, Guess what kind of a thing can we do that, that would shock everybody and it would seem so crazy that nobody would want, you know, believe it. And then we could, you know, bring it out in front of people and look at this, you know, or anything like that. It was completely different. Um, what really, uh, and again, it's a long story, so I'm going to make it extremely short here. We were working on a project together. We had been, uh, learning. They had brought me on at this uh, place to sort of, introduce the idea of working in an agile manner. And we were learning a lot of, you know, the agile ideas and attitudes along with some of the practices people have. And we were doing a, a, a weekly study session, two and a half hour study session, 
where we would do code katas. And a code kata is very similar to this, at least the way that we do it, that I like to do the code katas uh, in a coding dojo manner where everybody works together and they share the keyboard back and forth and discuss the problems. So what had happened, you know, the problem that you're working on, the kata or whatever. So what had happened to us is we had a big project that we were reviving. It's one that had been worked on and put on the shelf for a little while, and they needed to bring it back out, get it delivered. We all met in a meeting room to talk about it. So it's kind of how meetings usually happen. People gather, share some information, decide who's going to do what, and then go their merry way or separate ways and, and work on things separately. But as we were in the meeting, we started passing the keyboard back and forth. And some would say, oh, well, I know where that bit of code is, and I know what this thing does. And we had this control over here, the third-party thing that wasn't working well. And as we passed the keyboard around, we noticed we were getting a lot done. And at the end of that meeting, everybody, you know how it is in a lot of places where you work, uh, they've got meeting rooms, and you can schedule them for an hour or two, but you can't schedule them, you know, for eight hours in a row. So somebody was coming in for the next meeting, and everybody on my team said, let's go find another meeting room and keep doing this. So we did that, and we just kept doing that. At the end of the day, we do retrospectives often daily. At the end of that day, we did a quick retrospective, and on the smiley face sheet, it was all, you know, working together, collaborating. Um, we got a lot done. And on the not smiley smiley face sheet was, uh, you know, kind of a frowny face sheet. We noted, um, you know, we have to move from room to room and we had to carry everything, sort of that sort of thing. So after two or three days of doing that, we all started saying to each other, um, we need to find a place where we can just sit together all day long. So that's really, that's the birth of it in a nutshell or in a very large nutshell. And so, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't like somebody sitting down saying, I've got an idea. It was just we noticed something was working via our retrospective, and we just kept doing it. And we almost literally, I checked. I was checking the other day in our scheduler here, and I noticed from that day on, we've been working this way. So that's uh, three, almost three years, two and a half years. Wow. So I, I think guess... I answered all your questions. So we'll, yeah. uh, thanks. It was wonderful being here. Oh, it's not that easy. <laughs> See, Woody, it's funny. I, I heard the concept and I had actually seen, I read a few of your blog posts and had seen the um, had seen your materials for Agile 2013. And the scenario that I was in, um, this is was what we, what Lee and I called the infamous, the mob scenario was uh, Lee went on vacation for a week and uh, I got to help uh, keep a team that Lee was helping to facilitate moving in Lee's absence. And we had a, a customer request come in there in that week where it became very evident that they wanted us to integrate a new database into the system. And it's like we had siloed knowledge within the group where if we all got together, we had enough knowledge that we could pool our, our, our information and be successful. And so we, we adopted the mob construct to kind of do a spike. And what I observed was it immediately allowed a lot of learning to occur. You know, I was involved as a guy who knew the new database, so I'm sure that with the people who had never, it was a NoSQL database, so I'm sure that with the people who had never done that before, I'm miles deep in how to mock out the the, uh, the database objects that work with that in, in, uh, in Java, which is something that I don't do that much these days. So they're helping me say, oh, that's how you actually do that. And it was just a, it was a really awesome learning environment where everyone was able to walk away having said they learned something significant. And then going forward after that kind of spike period, the team was had enough knowledge spread across the team that they could go back to pairing on stories that were related to this new feature. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's sort of a, a two-way street in a way. The mobbing doesn't need to be a continual all-day thing. We don't necessarily always do everything focused at one computer. All the code we write goes through the one computer. So to physically do that, we've got you know, a couple projectors that project up on the wall. We also have some large monitors. Of course, a lot of the conference rooms have large monitors, but we found the projector was better. But the point is, once we're working and all our code's going that way, we still have other computers around. And often somebody will just say, oh, I've, I've got something I'm going to look up. And maybe two or three of us will be um, alta vista something at the same time. And as we're um, doing that, we don't really use alta vista, but anyways. <laughs> um, I was going to say, is that even still online? I would look that up. It probably is. Um, they never shut anything off on the Internet. So anyways, <laughs> uh, you can find a cached version of it somewhere. Um, Actually, it goes to Yahoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've heard of them too. And so um, so 
we, we there could be two or three of us looking up something, and then we will be messaging to our main screens um, the things that we're finding. But we're all sitting there, so we could be talking to each other through anything that we're doing. When we do have some solo work to do, which occasionally happens, like a, an expense report or something, we'll walk off. Uh, we have some other areas we can go and work, but it's rare that it occurs. This is a very nuanced thing. I want to observe one thing that you had mentioned, the learning. You, you were learning a lot. Now, I think that that's one of the benefits of what we're doing. What we noticed was we were getting a lot done, and we were moving quickly, we're moving forward quickly. Almost no miscommunications. Like you have in a meeting, everybody talks about something, they go away, they come back at the next meeting, and it turns out some people misunderstood things. And then, of course, they start sending emails back and forth, and the emails make it more clouded. And then you start adding your boss's name to the emails, and they start adding their boss's name to the emails. You know, and it gets bigger and bigger, because everybody's trying to cover themselves in this bad communication methodology of emails. We don't have any of that. So I, I want to make the point that we noticed good things. We started noticing good things because of it. We didn't go in saying, we're going to solve this problem, we're going to solve that problem. We just started noticing problems fading away. What's so interesting to me about this story, Woody, and, and what you guys have done is that it started organically, almost by accident, coming out of your, your code kata sessions and the and the folks on your team all saying, wow, this is fun, this is a great idea, we're being productive, let's keep going. So it just sort of happened and, and I guess grew and evolved, right? The question I have as a follow-up to this is, since it happened organically, I'm guessing that you didn't start with any sort of ground rules, but did you've spoken a little bit about some of the ground rules, such as, hey, if you've got to do email on your expense report, go do that. Are there any sort of other ground rules that you guys have established to help keep your sanity when you're doing this? Yeah, we lost our chance on the keeping sanity thing a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, what we've found for ourselves is that the fundamental thing is to express kindness and consideration and respect for each other. That's the only real, what I would call, ground rules. It's like we, we have to stop being prideful about our work because anything that we think we have a right to be prideful about is going to be shown we don't. We have to act kind to other people because our weaknesses are going to be shown as well as their weaknesses. There's no way to hide in this way of working. I won't mention any names here, but I worked next to a guy for a couple years who never actually got anything into production without someone else rewriting it. So he, he could hide with that for a long time as long as somebody was willing to, you know, when it came time, push came to shove and it was integration period or whatever, that, you know, someone would pick up the work and get it done. But I kind of, once I started noticing that, I, I was really puzzled by it, but that can't happen in our group. You're, you're either contributing or you're not, and it's very clear, you know? Yeah, so there's, it's completely transparent. The same with pair programming, I think I've always said with pair programming, there's nowhere to hide, certainly with with the method of mob programming and the rotation that you do and the fact that everyone has to be engaged. Additionally, with mob programming, there's nowhere to hide. Well, and, well, and the other thing to throw out there, and this this goes back to, I guess, the scenario I described uh, when I made Lee's team mob, is the inherent, this uh, mobbing creates inherently more complexity in a team environment. Because, as you mentioned, Woody, everyone's working together. There's nowhere to hide and as a result, that increases the complexity of the human behavior between people. And what I've observed in multiple environments where I've done mobbing is some people feel that that creates this chaos or where the, the activity is not structured, but in reality, it really is. Yeah, I think it's actually, I would make maybe a counter observation. Okay, if you take pair programming and when two people are working together, they have to be able to get along well. They have to find a very, uh, uh, let's see, they, they need a, I've got to find the right word, a protocol that makes it easy for them to work together with two people. But then you only have two personalities that you're trying to mesh. But with five or six people, you now have a kind of a balance mechanism. If two people in that group really couldn't pair well together, they now have three other or four other people who can temper the way they work and interact with each other. It's kind of like with a couple that's always snippy with each other. Maybe, you know, they're, they're having some problems. They go out with their friends, and now they're on their best behavior because they don't want to come across as the two creepy people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they they, they will, are going to try and act a little bit more normal. 
And so I think we get this extra tempering of personality when we're working with more than two people. Now we have somebody in there who maybe is a little more sophisticated emotionally and can say, you know, you guys are both saying a pretty nice thing here, but you don't seem to be able to see each other's point of view. Let me see if I can get a, a take on it. So you get that, that person that maybe has a more sophisticated skills, and they bring everyone together. So th I, I think we have found that we get a very nice flow among everybody because there's more people to draw from to balance the experience. So Woody, I, I have a question. We have we try to create a balance in our teams where we have some experienced developers and some less experienced developers, uh, with the hope of of kind of doing some training along the way when we were while we're pairing. I assume that this is uh, mob programming seems to be a really good way of doing that as well. But sure. then, do you have instances where you have uh, less experienced programmers that feel like they're not being able to contribute and have issues with that? Yes, we've noticed a lot of um, these types of interactions, and that's a really good observation. I have heard a lot of people when they're talking about pair programming, about how you have to have a balanced skill sets and all this sort of thing. And I don't doubt that in, in a lot of situations. But on the other hand, we kind of have a heuristic we work with. The idea is the, if you're not contributing something or getting something, then maybe it's a good time for you to go off and work on something alone which rarely happens. The point is, is it's not a matter of you contributing, necessarily. It's a matter of you contributing at the right moments. And the rest of the time, you're either getting something from it, or you're at least helping keep the flow of everybody, because there's sort of this idea of a, of a group me uh, memory, and where, where somebody will be sitting there working on something, and then two people go get deep into it, and then as they come back out of it a little bit, they'll say, now, what was that thing we were talking about a few minutes ago? Somebody's going to remember it. And they say, yeah, it was back on this. So there's a whole lot more going on here than just, am I contributing every second, or am I learning something every second? In fact, I, I would kind of, I don't know what other kinds of works you guys have done, and, and then you've got an audience out there listening to us, and who knows what all their backgrounds are, but I've got a pretty varied background. And in my past, uh, for example, I worked on some uh, installation crews that were installing you know, in the construction world. Well, an installation crew might have five or six people. Uh, one's operating a crane. Another one's in the crane. There's two other on ladders. Uh, there's some big heavy thing they're moving around. All these people have to be involved, but not every second. You know, when I'm lifting something with the crane and there's a, uh, there's a guy in a bucket up above, He's not doing anything for the moment till the thing's near where he can work with it, and so on and so on. But if we would do my job of moving the thing up there, then we'd stop everything, and then we'd say, okay, now we got to get something up into the bucket, and so on. Then we wouldn't be flowing our work. So everybody's at the right place at the right time to contribute to an overall thing that's happening. Now, that might be more complex. Maybe I explain it more complex than I need to, but it, does, it means it's not so much about contributing all the time or even getting something all the time. It's about being there to contribute at the exact moment where we all get the best benefit. Well, and Woody, what I, what I really like about what you just said is it, it was the word contribute. Because, like, I know a pattern that I see a lot of teams do, and I know, actually, Lee, Lee you see this all the time because we work in the same organization. Uh, teams have a turnaround meeting to effectively have a discussion and make a decision which then inevitably maybe a pair or a person they take the action to go do whatever the decision was what's great about a mob is well the whole team is involved in that and there's continuity between the discussion to have that decision and then actually getting it done so it, it reduces the feedback loop and uh, there, there's, there's great because I've seen teams that have, they have a turnaround for 20 minutes, then a pair takes the out re result of the turnaround, works, starts working on a story, and in the course of working on the story, they change the outcome of the turnaround just working independently. Yeah, so that there is a, a very rapid feedback that's occurring here from a point of view that the decision gets made, we take action on the decision, and we all can see the results of that decision immediately. And if it's not a good decision, which I would argue maybe all you can't have a bad decision in this because as, as soon as we see that something's not working the way we want, someone on the team's going to say, you know what, there was that other thing somebody sparked in my mind a few minutes ago. Let's try this instead. And, and so we quickly get through problems that might block a team for a week, you know, because of the way communications happen in teams. 
like the next morning at a stand-up meeting, someone brings up something, oh, I was working on that thing, and then this happened. Well, it, the hope would be you would just go and have the discussions, but it's much harder to get everybody on the same level understanding of something when you have to go and get them up to speed all the time. This is the idea of alignment, really. So we're in this sort of a constant alignment. It's like if, if you're driving your car, and, and you hit a pothole, and all of a sudden the wheel goes out of alignment, right? Yeah. So it's like, ah, uh, it tweaked something. And now you've got this wobble in the front end. So what are you going to do? You know, stop the car, correct the wobble, and go on? That's what you'd like to do. But you're going to wait a few days, get it to the dealer. He's going to say, oh, you messed this thing up. So let's have a self-aligning wheel. Somebody invent that, please. And with a self-aligning wheel, then we never have to worry about it. As soon as something's out of alignment, it's brought back into alignment. So let me ask a follow-up on that. I'm just kind of going back to just the mechanics of mobbing. Real life, you know, on a, if you're working on a team, more than likely you probably got some people that come in early because they're morning people. You got the people that come in later, just hang around till the evening. And so how does that work in the mob where you might not have everyone there at the time when the, there are people available to do work? So back to the construction model. I've got a guy operating the crane, a guy in the bucket, two guys on ladders. One comes in at 10 o'clock. The other guy goes out to lunch at 10 o'clock. You know, is this going to work? Well, no. <laughs> there's a limitation here. So we have to realize there's some constraints. We could probably say, okay, we're going to have core working hours. You know, with the way it is on a team, maybe you know, two and a half hours of core working hours because everything overlaps, people's lunches, people's exercise, and all the things that they do during the day. And And I think that this is critical if you see, like, the first slide in my presentation, or second one, is the idea about same thing, same time, same space. So in, in a regular Agile, what I would consider an Agile environment, we get pretty close to all of that just by communicating a lot during the day and, and having a limited amount of work in process and however we want to go about doing that through uh, iterations and uh, people you know, bringing stories, a limited number of stories into something. We're kind of all focusing on the same thing. But here we've got one item. We're always working on one item as a team. So it's really focused, the idea of working on the same thing at the same time, same place. One of the things that I found interesting in your presentation, Woody, on the Oradev presentation uh, out on Vimeo, and, and of course we'll have the, the link to that presentation in the show notes at thisagilelife.com, you were talking about the productivity and the efficiency of the team, and you showed an image of a small smattering of, of story cards, and you said this is the before, and then the after image was many, many more, which just blew me away, I guess. My assumption going into this would be maybe about the same if you were lucky to attain the same. It seems counterintuitive now to think that way because there's so much that, the team can do, you said, with the communication, everybody being in sync all the time. If you needed someone that had a particular area of expertise or knowledge, they're right there, they jump right in, participate, and uh, keep everybody going. I'm imagining, Woody, that you get a lot of questions from people about the efficiency and the productivity. I know I certainly did when we started with pair programming. So uh, did you have to explain to you, to management at your place of work how this was going to work, or did they just kind of give you some rope, take a leap of faith with you guys and say, go do it? How did that all happen? First of all, yes. The productivity thing is something people always will ask. <clears throat> how can this be as productive? I think we put way too much emphasis on the concept of productivity when we should put the emphasis on the level and quality of outcome. So you can produce a lot of stuff that makes no difference. The rapid feedback that can happen from a continual deployment or at least a daily deployment and all the things, the good things that we're learning about in Agile can far outweigh what we used to think about as productivity. Getting story cards done or story points through, those kind of ideas, you could hear the negative tone in my voice. That's not productivity. It's no more productivity than saying we finished the requirements phase. Uh, we we finished the um, analysis phase, and now our architect is finished. You know, so what is productivity? It's not nearly as important as it is as getting a lot of good stuff done. 
you know, it's, the term productivity can be a little distracting because we want to measure things. So, yeah, so let, but let's talk a little bit about convincing management. What's important to me is that the people that we're doing the things for, and you can call them stakeholders or your customer or whatever, that they're happy, that they're getting a lot of things done, that they're seeing continuous progress, and they're getting to use the software much earlier rather than later. So convincing somebody that that's a good thing, it's, it's another one of those things that just fades away once you start doing it. People don't keep asking, when's this going to be done? Because they know they're just going to keep getting good stuff uh, continuously. So, But I will give a lot of kudos to my boss who gave us the freedom, and this is something that I think is critically important, it's the role of leadership in this is to give an environment where the team can figure out how best to get things done. If we don't give them that environment, then what we're going to get is somebody who doesn't understand how the work is getting done or can get better done, telling a team who should naturally know better, telling a team how to get that work done. So that's this concept of management that somehow a manager is supposed to know the better way to get things done. I've never met a programmer, by the way, who couldn't figure out some better way to do something. And if they're given the freedom and respect to do that, They'll find a way to do it. It's sort of the theory uh, X and theory Y or whatever people. Are people lazy and want to not get stuff done? Or are people uh, excited about getting stuff done? Are they interested in, in making things better? I think you're given the opportunity there. The vast majority of people are interested in making things better. So my boss here pretty much recognized that, that these are some pretty smart people and me. And so these are some pretty smart people. Let them figure it out. If they come to me and say, this is what we're doing, then go for it. We'll see soon enough whether it's good or not. And we've continued this way for quite a while. Did you guys have any dark days where you didn't feel like it was working or where you weren't getting along? Or did you have any difficulties along the way? Or was, was this all just sunshine and, and sugar and spice and puppy dog tales from the get-go? <laughs> Well, actually, that's the title of my next book. <laughs> ah, there we go. No, I haven't written it. Yes and no. I mean, they're, they're, it's kind of like with any group of people. I mean, like if you've got some buddies and you get together with them often, one guy's down, the other guys are up, it balances things out for you. You know, a couple guys might even get into it and everybody kind of slaps each other on the back afterwards, you know. So I don't think we've had any, I wouldn't say we had any times at all that I can think back on. There have been some little things where we uh, where we perhaps didn't agree on something, but we have some very easy heuristics on that that get us right over it. So, you know, that, just to use an example of that, if there's two people who are very adamant about a specific way of specific way to do something, then we'll just automatically try one or the other. Nobody takes offense at that. We just say, oh, well, let's try that one. Uh, no, that's not working. Let's try that one. Oh, well, that's a little better. And then by that time, somebody say, oh, I got another idea. So try them. It's the idea of there's, there's a blocking mechanism that happens in decision making where we're reluctant to make a decision. So we gather a lot of information. A lot of people get people signing off on it. And then once we made a decision, we really have to be strong at protecting that decision because people can say, oh, he made a dumb decision, you know. And so the idea is we share these responsibilities. So we haven't yet really had a case uh, that I know of where, where I would say we had a dark time or a, a serious problem. I guess the question I throw out there is, I guess what I when we talk about the efficiency piece, Woody, and I, I actually, even as a metrics person, I value the the collaboration. But do you have any thoughts on when a mob becomes too large that it loses some of the efficiencies of of mob programming? So that is another question: the productivity and how big can the mob get? That I always get asked. So the productivity one. I'll start by saying I, I don't know and I don't really care. Let's measure that. Maybe I don't care. Let's let's talk about the number of people. So we've had as many as 12 to 14 people working at one time. Now, I don't know that I could keep that going for more than a day or two, you know, that we would start feeling like we've got too many people there. But when everybody's interjecting stuff that's important at the right moment, we've moved some, through some big, complex things with that many people. Now, we have also done it as an exercise with um, – 16 people at a coding a code camp or something like that or a conference where everybody stayed engaged for three or four hours on a single thing we were working on. But, you know, that's a little different than work. So I would say this, 
if I had a thousand programmers and we were given the freedom to find the best way to work, we'd figure it out. It's a good but answer. Then, I, mean, I, I don't care. You know. You know, Woody. One of the things you talked about at, at the beginning of the show was that this is obviously not for everyone, right? Not everybody is going to be able to work in a mob. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. If I were to get a new team member that just couldn't fit in, I wouldn't try to force them to fit in. You know, if we brought somebody on, of course, when we would hire someone, we were going to hire them for the ability to get along. That's be part of what we're looking for, perhaps. But, yeah, I, I don't know. If somebody came on that, that just couldn't fit in, I, I, w- I don't feel it would be appropriate to force them to fit in. Sure. Uh, and small. from, like, a Myers-Briggs perspective, I always end up a little bit on the intro Intra, intra, what is it? Uh, introverted. Introverted. Side. Introverted yes. side. Even though I'm a podcaster and stuff like that, I still always come up, come out a little introverted. And I guess the thing about that that rings true with me in terms of the introversion is that when anytime I do spend time pairing or spend time working in a large group, that drains me of energy rather than filling my tank with energy, which is usually kind of the key differentiator from introverts to extroverts. Interesting. So I, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know much about these things. But I, I know in those same tests, I always come up, uh, out as an introvert as well. So I think those tests are broken. But um, but I but I do think I really like working alone. So I'm not saying that that everybody should just work this way. I've worked with a couple programmers who are just super brilliant, and uh, they worked best, you know, very isolated with. Uh, you know, the, when they could be alone with their thoughts, I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, it's just that, on the other hand, most of the guys on the team, most of the people on the team here, I think they're sort of introverts as well. So I, I think we can find a way to get, we we can all just get along. Of course. Or, or, or actually what I'll throw out there from, from behavioral science, and specifically for introverts, is the fact that in the mob, yes, there is social interaction between the different participants, but the person who has the keyboard, they're interacting with the keyboard, so that facilitates their contribution, which actually works really well. Uh, since you know, if you're if you're in a mob with, I'll, I'll unfortunately declare it, you know, a loudmouth like me, then guess what? If I don't have the keyboard, I'm inherently not in control. You know, so I could yeah, I could tell Lee, hey Lee, this is what we should be doing. No, I don't like it. I want you to refactor that database class. You know, whatever. But Lee's got the keyboard, so you know uh-huh. he's on, he's on the console, and I think it, for an introvert. That's empowering. So that that's really good because it, it, it helps level the playing field. Jason, all of that energy that you have, and God forbid you have a ton of energy, you would exhaust the hell out of me with all of that frenetic jumping around and oh, we gotta get over here and do this and you know. If we were mobbed together, I would I would hurt you. Yes. So someday this podcast oh. between you, John, me, Lee, Amos, if, if Woody could come along, we all need to do this, and some of them will come out not alive, probably. It'll probably me. But. So there's a couple, uh, there are several very interesting points being brought up in this. First of all, with the ground rule of the kindness and respect and consideration, we would probably be able to find a way to work together. But another thing is, so your style, Jason, is a little different than mine. The keyboard role, the way that, that we work, the keyboard is merely translating. So maybe this is a part of the mechanics we need to cover. The purpose of working this way is so that we can keep the discussion about what we're doing active and alive. And that is important to have happening and not interrupted by the keyboard. When we get at the keyboard, we have to start thinking in code. Otherwise, we're not getting our ideas into the computer, and that changes the way our brain works. So I would say, you know, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but I have read uh, some some books about this stuff, and I think the human brain is, is actually very much in tune to thinking visually. But by having human language, you know, the first people that started actually vocalizing and speaking to each other changed the nature, probably, of how our brains work. When that started happening, we started using these abstract things of words to mean something else, and it changed the way we start thinking. And I think that narrows down quite a bit when we got a computer language. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that we are programming at the human level as what we call the navigators, 
they're talking about it. And then we have to be able to express it in such a way that the translator, or what we call the driver, can translate that into code. They're not the one in control. They are merely there because we have no other way to get the code into the computer. So we actually ask usually, if you're at the keyboard and you, you really start getting the ideas, you would then give up your time at the keyboard. Someone really? else sit down. The point is to be able to communicate well the ideas at a human level, which means on the whiteboard, and it means by spoken language. If I can't explain something well enough to you as the driver to get it into the keyboard, then I haven't yet thought through well enough how to describe it. So that means my idea isn't fully formed. And the discussion that goes on among the navigators is the real programming as we come to a clear understanding of what we want to translate into code. It starts flowing so I can give a driver an instruction. Like, we're going to need a collection class of customers that we can iterate through, and we're going to want to do some sums on it and do some other aggregate things. And they can start coding that without any more instruction if they're that good of a programmer. And now the rest of the team can start talking about, now what are we going to do with it, and what's the result, what is the report going to look like, and things like that. So we're kind of moving. It's not one mind coding. It's sort of like a group of minds coming to a better understanding and getting it translated into the computer. So I probably said that too many different ways, and now everyone's confused. Well, but no, that's okay. No. No, actually, I think, actually, Woody, I th that's actually aligns to exactly um, a couple of things I know I've had to coach in mobs. Uh, number one is when I like to call it the, the driver goes on autopilot and starts doing things that have not been communicated to the group. And as a coach, you know, I've actually had the guide to say, hey, if, just because you have the keyboard doesn't mean you can go off and do whatever you want. You know, maybe if you've got an idea, you know, I actually really like your idea about asking someone to respectfully step away and to ensure that that idea is well understood. Say, hey, Lee, can you be the driver now and I'll explain my idea and yeah. we'll work it together. I actually really like that idea because in the past I've, you know, coached people who maybe they kind of wanted to be keyboard hogs and, and say, hey, at least if you're going to do that, if you have the idea and you're really rolling with it, please explain to the group what you're doing as opposed to just typing. So um, you, you make an extremely good point here and I want to emphasize it we have trouble releasing ourselves from the keyboard. That's a habit that we get, and uh, it, it is a, a difficult thing to break yourself of. And so the, the, the ability to just step away from the keyboard, you, you know, like when I do these as code codes at code camps and stuff, I, I just ask when, when the timer goes off, everybody puts their hands in the air. So we get the habit of everybody putting their hands in the air, because in the code codes I do, we do a four-minute rotation, so we'll get... Uh, you know, you've got your four minutes at the keyboard, but you're not the one thinking. There's a navigator that's assigned in the code codas, a little different with our mob, but in the, when we're doing this as a group uh, exercise, the navigator is assigned and the driver is assigned. At the end of four minutes, the driver gets up, the navigator sits down, and the next navigator in line comes in. Now it's that navigator's idea, and I normally will ask a question if I'm facilitating that. Where are we taking this next? They say, well, I'm going to finish out the pattern that we just started. Or, well, we've just ended that pattern or that little bit of code, and now what I think I need to do is this. And then we describe it in English. So the person at the keyboard can put comments in. They just are the, what are we going to do? So we describe it in English. It seems clear enough. Now we start coding it. As soon as the code, each line of code that replaces a comment, we, did, we remove the comment. So we get that into the English. Maybe we first describe it on the whiteboard, then it goes into English in comments, and English, because I speak English, and then it goes into code, whatever it happens to be. Uh, I speak many code languages, but, you know, right now here we're using C Sharp. So in it goes, and then it's done, and the comment can go away. So this is the process. It, because we express it out loud, it's getting vetted. It's getting the code reviews happening in real time, because we always do TDD. It's always test first then we, we have tests in place, and you describe your test first, that's the best way to go. So you describe that in English, you code the test, you don't code by intention, you know what these things are. We code by intention, then we can decide right then and there, this is good enough, no, it needs to be cleaned up, and we move on. What, now, what, I covered 10 different topics, sorry. What I think is amazingly groundbreaking about this, and maybe it's just me personally, I'm gesturing with my pencil and everybody's making fun of me. What I think is amazingly groundbreaking here is that in pairing, the position of power is with the keyboard. And 
that causes issues, I think, in pairing at times. And in mobbing, the position of power, when you're actually expressing ideas and having your ideas turned into code, is when you're predominantly not at the keyboard. Because the person at the keyboard has turned the brain off, and they're kind of just, as you say in the video, they're just the fingers, right? They're just the robot that conveys the ideas, takes the ideas, and converts them into that code. But it's really the other navigators, uh, the word that you use, Woody, they're the ones that are developing the code. They're the ones that are having the ideas, and they're telling the driver, the person at the keyboard, let's do this now, let's do that now. And, of course, that person makes some intelligent decisions about how to use the IDE, etc. But I think the, that position of power is then distributed through the mob and the navigators. And so you don't have that give me the keyboard, you know, having the keyboard is gives you somehow the, the power in that relationship. I would even say that uh, this kind of thing that uh, Woody was just talking about should be applied at the pair level, too, for those people yeah. that aren't at the luxury of, of being in a mob. Uh, you can still do the same thing in a pair. If you find yourself being the one with the idea, make sure you're not the one at the keyboard. I, again, it's really tough, but good thing to do. Well, it, it goes it goes back to that idea of saying, how are you, if you have the idea and all you do is you implement it and you don't force someone else to work through it with you, either in a mob or in a pairing context, then unfortunately you're the only person that gets that and that means if you get hit by the bus, you got a problem. Yeah, so we, we uh, you guys are making a very good point here and Lee, you brought up the idea that it, that as a pair, you can do this same thing. So I'm aware of at least six different pairing styles or, or modes. And I learned those over the years, different people showing me their own ideas about pairing. The, the guy who showed me this particular model was Llewellyn Falco. And the moment, and I, I have to say maybe my big strength is when I see something that's good, I usually catch on kind of quickly. I go, um, oh, I've all these years, and now I see how good this can be. You know, so it's like that's what happened here. I like pair programming. I won't work without a pair unless I absolutely have to. And But here, Llewellyn's going, um, well, this is how I like to work. And then we started on something. We were doing some open source stuff. And within minutes, I'm going, well, of course this is the way to work, you know. And he, he started rambling on as I was working. I, I was, he was navigating me. And I could see he would give me stuff, and he could tell I had enough to work for a few minutes. And then he would be just in a thinking mode, not saying anything. And I'm, I'm the, what we call the smart input device. We don't call it a robot. We don't call it a, like a dummy. It's the smart input device. It's the person at the keyboard. Because the keyboard itself is sort of a dumb input device. It can't do much until someone clicks on it, you know, pushes buttons. So I can code so he can say something. You know, it's just like I said a moment ago. If the level he needs to navigate at is click the X uh, click the D, you know, then we're never going to get anywhere. But if he can say, you know, make uh, go to line 32 and, and uh, let's create a, uh, a board object. Uh, we're going to make a game, you know, they're going to do a board object. Um, then spin up a couple player objects. Well, we don't have any of these objects yet. It's things that's in his head that we're going to have shortly. We're coding by intention. But by him saying enough, and he's got, okay, that's enough. i got to think about it. Then I'm keying in, and then he's going on in his brain where he's headed. And as soon as I'm ready... He's ready with the next idea. This gives breathing time where we, we're not constantly this task switching of going between programming idea, code idea. Programming idea, because programming is what is this going to do? And coding is translating into something that our limited programming language can understand. We don't want to use that limited language to think about the bigger concepts. But we always end up doing that if we're not careful. Now, I'm not try trying to sound too preachy here because there's a million right ways to do anything. And I know I just have a couple of nice ones that are working for me right now and working for our teams. There's a other better ways. Next week, somebody's going to come up with something better. You know, Maybe we'll find because we've gone too far this way. Single programmer, solo, pair programming, mob. Let's go the other way. We'll start cutting people in half, maybe put one part of them in this room. You know, something intriguing is going to come along. So I'm being a little bit silly. but Jason hopefully. Jason can code uh, standing on his head. Let's try this next. No. I like this. No. I'm waiting for I, the laid, laying down programming. 
I did the treadmill. That wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you see, you guys are already moving past these ideas. So, well, the brilliance of the crowd. So, guys, we're we're getting close here on time. I had one more mechanics question, John. Sure, um, I, I was I, going to actually give us a chance here to kind of do a quick lightning round, so we could each, each ask a couple of quick questions to wrap things up. So, Jason, why don't you kick off the lightning round? Then? So, so me- quick lightning round question, Woody, is from a whole team approach. We've talked a lot about programming today. If you have non-developers on your team, product owners, business analysts, are they part of the mob? Yes. Or w- what do they do? Yes, they're part of the mob. If they just don't want to take the keyboard, which we always welcome them to, they're just contributing at the level that they can contribute, which is usually very high concepts, such as we need a drop-down that interacts with this other drop-down. We can be coding that while they're talking about it, and we often do that. Now, we don't always have our product person with us, but same could go with QA uh, or whatever. You know, We really would like to see that balance out. When we're really focused on a QA task that is not purely a coding QA task, then, then we want to share the keyboard as well. So almost any – we have several people who started their careers as QA on our team right now, and, and they've all become rather good coders as well. Not that you have to be – a coder to be QA, that somebody's going to flame me now. But um, they still use that term. Anyways, okay, next lightning question. <laughs> okay, my turn. Uh, my question is, how long should you take at the keyboard? And I know you, you said in your presentation it differs depending on kind of your mob skill level. So what would you say for a team that's starting out? I'd start as, as little as possible, maybe four or five minutes, but I, I really wouldn't recommend uh, anything in particular. I'd just say try a handful of things. I think the less time, the better. We're a bit sophisticated maybe because we've been doing it for a while, and we get to act like we know what we're doing, so we're at 15 minutes. But it could have been, I mean, 10 minutes would work just as fine for us. It's just what we're using right now. Uh, there's no limit. There's no rules. So why is less time better for beginners? Let's learn to break our relationship with the keyboard. So by, by rotating quickly, so let's say uh, it doesn't matter how many minutes you're at the keyboard, but if you got six people, then nobody's at the keyboard for more than uh, 10 or so minutes per hour. We're going to learn pretty quick how to give up that feeling that we must be connected to the keyboard. You've got to be willing to break up with the keyboard. Yeah, there you go. If you want to roll with us, you gotta you got to give up that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's sad. But anyways, next... Oh, okay. I guess that comes to me. And I have to say that, that I'm so inspired by uh, all this, this discussion, Woody, that my question is something to, to kind of close us all out. I think, what's the meaning of life? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I do know that. And it, it, it's not a number. And uh, <laughs> But I don't have time to tell you it right now. Oh, so, yeah, somebody that I, finally I, knows the answer and I'm missing. Oh, Okay. I, I would like to close out with something that I think is important if we're really done with questions, and that is that people uh, always ask uh, or often have asked, do you recommend this? And, and I want to make it very clear that we don't. There's nothing about this that we rec- recommend. We were asked by people to share this at a couple little conferences. It's grown into more and more people asking us to share, and that's what we're doing. There's nothing here that I would say you should be doing this. This is an idea. If you're interested, give it a try. Uh, I'll put a point on that this way. If somebody were to call me up right now and say, our our boss uh, watched your video and he wants us all to do mob programming now, can you come and teach us how to do that? What I'd really want to do is come and teach you how to do retrospectives. And, and let's learn to get good at retrospectives. And you can discover what's best for your team if you're good at that. And that's a very sophisticated thing to learn to do. Get Diana Larson to come to your company and give you training in retrospectives. Nobody can train you to get good at it. That will give you a start, though. Somebody like that. Get somebody sophisticated at facilitating. Get a couple of people in your company. Learn to be good at that. And let's get good at retrospectives, reflecting, tuning, adjusting. We can take baby steps. And those baby steps mean the status quo stays the status quo while it's being changed a little bit at a time so we never have to get uncomfortable. It's always just a little different, just enough different that we can handle it. I think you did answer my question, Woody. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry about that. This week's Hottest Picks. Okay, guys, let's do our picks, and we're going to start tonight with Lee. Well, uh, I actually uh, was looking at 
uh, some stuff for my daughter. My daughter is uh, is ten, and I came across this iPad app called Tinker, spelled T Y N K E R, and it's a great little app to teach kids how to code. And my daughter loves animals, so in this particular game, the free version. Uh, started out with a little dog that had to find its family, and you had to to program the dog, starting with barking it, uh, getting it to bark, and then getting it to run forward and bark. And it was it's a really great little uh, way to teach kids how to code without they they learn the concepts of coding without necessarily using a particular language. And my daughter loved it. I mean, she she got through several levels of this thing after we bought the the whole app for I think three bucks. And it was it was awesome. It can be used for kids as young as uh, first grade, uh, all the way up through high school, depending on how complex you want to get. And uh, I think for definitely those kids under about twelve, it's an excellent excellent resource. So that's at www.tinker.com if you want to see that. T Y and T Y K N K E R. Yeah. Lee, did your kids participate in the Hour of Code at school? They did not. No, I wish they had. That would be awesome. All right. Well, Tinker.com, we'll check that one out. Thanks, Lee. I'm gonna, I am gonna. think I'm going to download that one tonight. Okay, Jason, what are your picks? So I have three this week. So as usual, this is not enforced. You can have as many as you want. Right, John? So my first, um, as you, for those of you that might be new to this Agile Life, you know, we're, we're based out of St. Louis, Missouri, although we have people join us from all over the place, like Woody's tonight join us from outside of St. Louis. But I, I actually, I just happened to stumble into, we have, a, we have two Agile groups in town. One is called Agile Link that, that actually John's presented at before. Uh, but we have another one called the St. Louis Agile Users Group. We'll put the link to their, uh, their LinkedIn site on the show notes. And what's unique about this group is they, uh, they meet in an area called the Metro East, which is just east of St. Louis, and they meet right by an Air Force base. So the attendance at the at the meetings is a lot of people who are work, doing Agile in the public sector, and they're familiar with the challenges that doing Agile in the public sector, basically at the Air Force base, how there's basically there's the opportunity to exchange lessons learned from the from the private sector over to the public sector and vice versa. So they have monthly meetings, and um, they I think I've, they asked me if I could help them and share some ideas at a few of them. So check that out. Next thing I'll plug is uh, Dave Snowden's blog has a very interesting post that he put out just recently on, on the Scaled Agile Framework. I had to read it three times myself to figure out what it kind of meant. It was very deep, to say the least. So if you uh, if you know Dave Snowden, um, he's out there always talking about very advanced concepts. We'll put it in the show notes. Check it out. I have a feeling we'll talk about it on a future episode of This Agile Life. And in honor of having Woody on today, I have to, uh, of course, plug the 2014 Agile Games Conference, where uh, Woody is one of our featured presenters. He'll be doing a three-hour workshop on mob programming. I believe we're going to hopefully have a mob of some kind so we can all try this out uh, for those that might be interested in kind of seeing what it feels like. And to your point, Woody, what we talked about tonight, having a chance to experience the mechanics that you've worked with teams to best position for success. So those are my three, John. Three picks, Jason. Thanks. I've only got one. I tend to just have one pick to kind of balance out Jason sucking up all the time with his hundreds of picks, you know, so... Um, my pick tonight, it was, it was all over Twitter today. Uh, it's a slide that epitomizes how to use Agile to grow software. And it was from a presentation that somebody from Spotify was giving. And I can't really do it justice by describing it to you, but I'll go ahead and give it a try. You'll just have to check it out at the show notes. But it's kind of a picture of how to develop software without uh, Agile. And it's got this crazy, they're trying to build a car, and it's a crazy way of doing it. But the bottom part one, which is agile, they're trying to build a car, and they first build like a, a skateboard, and then a scooter, and then a bicycle. And, and I just thought that was kind of the perfect little pictorial image of growing software with agile. So check that out in the show notes. Okay, the position of honor goes to Woody. Woody, what are your picks tonight, sir? Excellent. So, of course, um, I was talking about Daniel Larson, Esther Derby's book, the Agile Retrospect is making, I think it's making good teams great. So uh, we got a link to that. It's, I've been to a few places over the years to visit, and I've seen that on the shelf, like in a brand new state, and it should look all beat up and worn out, and the cover partly ripped and all that. So learn that book, read what's in there, internalize it, invent your own stuff. 
I'd also like to talk about approval tests. We use a lot of approval tests. If you guys haven't talked to Llewellyn Falco, had him on your show, he's done some brilliant things. And that's a wonderful, uh, we use the approval test uh, library in our unit test. It's been ported to many, many uh, languages. It's free, open source. Uh, it gives a way to do extremely expressive uh, unit testing. I love it. I uh, use it a lot. He also is involved in this thing that's called Teaching Kids Programming, him and Lynn Langett. And I recommend very highly for people who are trying to find a way to, to teach kids programming uh, to take a look at it. It's fantastic. I was involved in a couple of his sessions, giving that at some schools. And there's a lot of people doing good things with teaching kids. Uh, but this is using TDD. It's very fun. Kids seem to love it. And it's you can put it on a thumb drive. You can use it anywhere. It's pretty cool. So take a look at that. I, I think you'll enjoy it. Those are great picks, Woody. We'll have to get in touch with Llewellyn and see if he wants to join us on the show. He's another one of our featured presenters at the 2014 Agile Games Conference. Oh, good plug. Uh, yeah, and, and so that was just an accidental uh, coincidence there. But uh, I think going to the Agile Games is going to be a great thing. I'd love to see you guys there. And anybody who can make it, it's, it's going to be wonderful. Woody, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show tonight. I wish the whole our whole listening audience could see the the beautiful sun as it sets on on your head there yeah, in no, your it looks office like a tonight. Halo, doesn't it? You you look like an angel. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody tells me that. Yeah. In all seriousness, Woody, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your Thank ideas. You, you're too kind. I I really appreciated having the chance to visit, and uh, it's great to get to know you a bit. Wonderful. All right, guys, that's all we have time for. Check out thisagilelife.com to find the show notes for this episode. You can also find all of our past episodes and the show notes for those episodes. And out there right now, we've got a offer. If you sign up for our mailing list, we'll send you our top 10 Agile resources that we've collected over our 42 various shows uh, I kind of put those into a top 10 list, and I'll email those to you immediately. Thanks for listening, and keep living this Agile life. This Agile life is brought to you by a community of Agile developers and coaches aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.